We must pray for our protection from the evils that surround us, and uh, this would include spiritual evils as well as the uh, physical evils like uh, uh, the diseases and so forth that we hear so much about in these days. May God protect us from them. You are please, uh, we are asked to please remember in your prayers the soul of Howard Estridge, longtime member of St. Jude's, who died unexpectedly last Sunday in Australia at the age of 72. Please also remember Howard's widow, Mary, and the entire Estridge family, whose ordeal over Howard's death has been made even more severe due to the oppressive lockdown conditions in Australia. This prevented some close relatives from attending Howard's burial, which had to be conducted without benefit of a Catholic priest. So we pray for uh, Howard. I remember when I arrived, they were here, the whole family, and since that time, they've uh, moved out, or or most of them, I guess, to California or down to Australia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. At all times and in all places, God has called forth saints to be witnesses for his divine Son, Jesus Christ, and for the Holy Trinity, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Some of their names are known to us, others are known only to God until Judgment Day, when they will be seen to shine like the sun, or the stars of heaven for all eternity. Until then, the Church celebrates the Feast of All Saints, not only to honor them, but to remind us that we are all called to be saints. Today, we not only need saints, we need to be saints. And the saints are our friends, but much more than friends, they are our true brothers and sisters. Some would say that all men are brothers, but this can be true only on the natural level. Although as descendants of Adam and Eve, we are all of the same species, we are strangers to one another because of original sin. This is evident today when even those of our own nation are turning into caricatures of the human species. They do not know God. They are citizens of this world only without true wisdom or intelligence. Now, of course, I'm not speaking about everybody, but uh, this is largely true. Nations break down and civilizations fall because national pride and patriotism of themselves have no power to create an enduring unity or lasting freedom. The Masonic organizations speak of the brotherhood, but there can be no true brotherhood in sin. And Satan has no power to unite except in evil which only ends in division. Even the bonds of natural human love, noble as it may appear in the eyes of men, cannot overcome the alienation that is caused by sin. We were all destined, if God had not intervened and sent a Redeemer, for eternal separation in the loneliness of hell, without brothers or sisters, without friends, and without God. But our Lord Jesus Christ, before he died, made it possible for us to become true brothers and sisters once more. When he pronounced the words, this is my body and this is my blood of the new and eternal covenant, which shall be shed for you and for many under the remission of sins, he was creating a communion of saints and giving us a way to become true brothers once more. The result is that we are separated from the world by our holy baptism. Our first Holy Father, St. Peter, tells us that we are called out of the darkness of unbelief. You, however, he says, are a a a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a purchased people, that you may proclaim the perfections of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. But the present Vatican II pontiff, Aurea Bergoglio, denies that separation when he proposes setting up a brotherhood of nations based on an unredeemed humanity. He is teaching the false doctrine that all men are brothers. 
In effect, he denies the power and the necessity of the grace of God won for us by Jesus Christ through his death on the cross. He denies the doctrine of original sin. And if there is no original sin, there is no need for the sacrament of baptism. Neither is there any need for the other sacraments, for the Catholic faith, for the church itself, or for our divine Savior, Jesus Christ. There are witnesses, and he is raising up witnesses to strengthen us in our holy faith and to warn the world of the coming chastisement. I could believe that Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano and President Donald Trump are the two witnesses spoken up spoken of in the book of the Apocalypse. Vigano actually suggests that Trump is the restrainer that St. Paul speaks about in his second letter to the Thessalonians when he says, For the mystery of iniquity is already at work, provided only that he who is at present restraining it still does restrain until he is gotten out of the way. It may seem odd to some that God would choose Donald Trump to restrain the workers of iniquity, but God chooses whom he wills, as when he chose the pagan king Cyrus to set the Jewish exiles in Babylonia free and to build their temple in Jerusalem. Moreover, Trump professes to be a believer in Jesus Christ, and he has a great admiration for the true Catholic Church. Vigano warns in his later, latest letter to Trump, a quote, a global plan called the Great Reset is underway. Its architect is a global elite that wants to subdue all of humanity, imposing coercive measures with which to drastically limit individual freedoms and those of entire populations. In several nations, this plan has already been approved and financed. In others, it is still in the early stage. Behind the world leaders who are the accomplices and executors of this infernal project, there are unscrupulous characters who finance the World Economic Forum and Event 201, promoting their, promoting their agenda. Archbishop Vigano also has this to say in his paper for the Catholic Identity Conference 2020, which took place recently and he employs the image of an eclipse of the sun. And this is what he says. For 60 years, we have witnessed the eclipse of the true church by an anti-church that has progressively appropriated her name, occupied the Roman Curia and her dicasteries, dioceses and parishes, seminaries and universities, convents and monasteries. The anti-church has usurped her authority and its ministers wear her sacred garments. It uses her prestige and power to appropriate her treasures, assets, and finances. The process that led to today's eclipse of the church began with modernism without a doubt. The anti-church followed its orbit despite the solemn condemnations of the magisterium, which in that phase shone with the splendor of truth. But with the Second Vatican Council, the darkness of this spurious entity came over the church, which uh, explains the eclipse of the church. Vigano contrasts the true church with the anti-church. And he says, the Catholic church lives under the gaze of God. She exists for his glory and for the salvation of souls. The anti-church lives under the gaze of the world pandering to its blasphemous apotheosis of man and the damnation of souls. Our Lord made this promise to St. Peter and to his church, which we trust, uh, in, we, in which we trust this promise. I say to thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.